In this video, we solve problem 14.8.017 from the Larson and Edwards Calculus Early Transcendental Functions text 7th edition. We're asked to use the indicated change of variables to evaluate the double integral. And we have the double integral over R of four times the quantity X squared plus Y squared, where this is our region R. Now we're given this transformation. We're told that X is equal to one half of U plus V, while Y is equal to one half of U minus V. Now that is a transformation T, which takes us from a point UV and gets us to an X and a Y. Now, if this transformation is one-to-one, -one, that means it also has an inverse transformation. And basically what we want is we want to evaluate this integral by instead evaluating an equivalent integral um, in terms of u and v. And the way we get to that equivalent integral is this way. We think about what the image of this region R would be under a transformation. If this is the transformation that gets us from u, v to x and y, if I wanna go backwards, there's an inverse transformation that would get us from x and y back to u and v. We wanna figure out uh, what the image of R would be under that transformation. We call that the region S. And then we want to integrate over S. So it turns out that that double integral over R of f of x and y can be evaluated pretty simply. Once we find the region S, we can describe the region S with bounds for u and v. Those will go right here. This integrand needs to be written in terms of u and v. So you'll just take your original function of x and y and replace x with whatever it is in terms of u and v. In this case, it's one half of the quantity u plus v. You'll replace y with whatever it is in terms of u and v. That's this right here. And this area piece, which used to be dx times dy, is equal to this, which is the Jacobian of this transformation um, times du and dv. So the first thing that we, we really wanna do, or the first thing that we typically do, is we find the image of this region R under the transformation T inverse. And we typically do that by just looking at one line at a time. Now, different textbook authors handle this differently. And they often just look at the transformation of each of these points. And they say, OK, assuming that the transformation is one to one, each of these points corresponds to a point over here. And then they just create a parallelogram um, or a rectangle or whatever it is over here um, by, by mapping those points given the transformation. But I really like to think about the transformation, taking one line and transforming it into, it into another line. So I wanna do this a little differently. I want to, to see what this line looks like um, in terms of U and V and then graph that over here. Um, so we'll do that. And we'll do that one little line segment at a time. I'm calling it line one, but I'm really thinking of that line segment. And I would describe that this way. That's a line with a slope of one because we go up one and over one. And the y-intercept is one because when x is zero, y is one. That's where our line crosses the y-axis. Now we don't want the whole line. We just want the part of the line where x is between negative one and zero. Now I can figure out what the corresponding line is in the uv plane by making a substitution. I'll replace y with one half of u minus v and replace x with one half of the quantity u plus v. And then I'll find out what the image of this line is under the transformation t inverse, which gets us from x and y back to u and v. To do that, I will take this equation and rearrange it. Let's multiply everything by two. Let's subtract u from both sides. Let's subtract v from both sides, and then we'll divide everything by negative two. So I have v equals negative one. Now in the uv plane, v equals negative one looks like this. V is playing the role of y. Um, but we don't get the whole line over here. If we're just looking at the image of this line segment, line one, we only get part of this line, v equals negative one. Um, to figure out what part of that line we get, we can use these bounds for x. x is between negative one and zero. 
and x is one half of u plus v, so I can just substitute, replace your x with one half of u plus v, and then multiply both or all three parts of this compound inequality by two. And then we're, remember we're on the line where v is equal to negative one, so I can substitute that over here. And then I'll add one to all three parts of this compound inequality. So this says that this little line segment here under the transformation T inverse, which takes us from X's y and Y's back to U's and B's, lands us over here on the line where V is equal to negative one and U is between negative one and one. So this is what we'll see. That is the image of line one. Okay, let's do the same thing with line two. Line two um, is a line with a slope of negative one. We go down one and over one. Y-intercept is still one. And then we would replace the Y with whatever we were given for Y in terms of U and V. So Y is one half of U minus V. And then we replace X with one half of the quantity U plus V. Then we say, okay, well, what happens to that? Or, or how does that simplify, excuse me? What line is that in the UV plane? To simplify, I'll multiply everything by two and I'll distribute this negative as well. Add V to both sides, add U to both sides, and then we'll divide by two. So U is equal to one. And again, just like before, U equals one looks like this. U is playing the role of X in the UV plane. So it's a vertical line, but we don't get the whole vertical line. We just get part of the vertical line. And which part depends on the, the range of values for X. Here, X goes between zero and one for line two. So I'll take this inequality and I'll replace X with one half of U plus V. Then I'll multiply all three parts here by two. And then remember that U is equal to one. So you can substitute that in. And then we'll subtract one from all three parts of this compound inequality. And we'll have V is between negative one and one. So the image of this line segment number two is this, it's U equals one, where V is between negative one and one. So there's V equals negative one, there's V equals one. And I'm right there now. That's the image of line one, the image of line two. Now let's look at the image of line three. First, we'll write that equation for line three in terms of X and Y. We've got a slope of negative one. We go down one and over one. And the y-intercept is negative one. And notice also that x is between negative one and zero there. Then we'll substitute to find this the, the corresponding line in the UV plane. Remember that y is one half of u minus v, x is negative one half of the quantity u plus v, multiply everything by two, distribute the negative, add v to both sides, add u to both sides, and we get u equals negative one. Again, that's a vertical line we don't want the whole vertical line. We just want the part of the vertical line that corresponds to the image of line segment number three here to figure out which part. We'll replace X with one half of U plus V. Multiply by two. Then I look over here, I see that U is negative one. I'll substitute that in. 
And then I want V by itself in the middle. So I'll add one to all three parts of this compound inequality. And I see that V is between negative one and one. So you can probably guess that the image of line four is gonna be right here. And this is gonna be our square. Um, and this will be the image S. of R under the transformation T inverse. But let's prove it to ourselves. Line four is a line with a slope of one with a y-intercept of negative one. So that's y equals x minus one. Y is one half of u minus v. X is one half of the quantity u plus v. Multiply everything by two. Subtract u from both sides, subtract v from both sides. Divide. So we get v equals one, which is exactly what we expected. And then I bet our bounds for u are between negative one and one. Let's prove it. x was between zero and one and x was one half of the quantity u plus v. So multiply by two and v is one. So subtract one from all three parts here. And yes, we get that u is between negative one and one. So that's s and that's nice. u goes from a constant to a constant and so does v. So our bounds for this new double integral are these u ranges from negative one to one, and so does v. v also ranges from negative one to one. We've got our new bounds. All right, now we just need a new integrand in terms of u and v, and then the new dA. So let's compute that integrand. Now our original integrand was four times the quantity x squared plus y squared. And x was one half of u plus v and y was one half of u minus v, of course, and with the appropriate parentheses there. Now, if I've got a product and I'm squaring it, I can square each factor separately. So this is four times one half squared, which is one fourth times u plus v squared. And then I've got a one half squared there, which is one fourth times the quantity u minus v squared. I can factor out a one fourth from both of those. I have one fourth times four. Which is just one. And then if we expand this further. So let's use this paper. we end up over here. Got u plus v squared plus u minus v squared. First times first is u squared, outer times outer is uv, inner times inner is just like it. So we've got two of those, last times last is v squared. And I have something similar here, u minus v times u minus v. First times first is u squared, outer times outer is minus uv, inner times inner is just like it. Last times last is v squared. These guys reduce and we end up with two u squared plus two v squared. Now that is our new integrand in terms of u and v or our original integrand in terms of u and v. All right, and the last piece is that area piece. It's gonna be the absolute value of the Jacobian of the transformation times du times dv. And remember your 
formulas for that transformation are these. You can distribute that one half if you want to. You don't have to, but I think it makes it even easier to compute those partial derivatives. All right, so that's enough for us to write down the Jacobian. Remember, it's this two by two determinant. In the first row, you have the partial derivatives of your first variable x with respect to the variables u and v. The second row, you do the same thing, but you start with y. You take its partial derivatives with respect to u and v. The partial derivative of x with respect to u and also with respect to v is just a one half and a one half. And the partial derivatives of y with respect to u and v are one half and negative one half. Remember, I'm just taking the coefficient of that. The derivative of a constant times u with respect to u is just the constant. This doesn't have any u's in it, so the derivative of that with respect to u would be zero. Then when I take the partial derivative of this with respect to v, I get zero here, and then the negative one half times one there. So that's how we get that last row. And the row, the first row is similar. Now when I evaluate this two by two determinant, I multiply across that diagonal, I get negative one fourth. I multiply across that diagonal and I subtract, I also get negative one fourth. So that's negative two fourths or negative one half. So that means that our area is the absolute value of that negative one half, which is gonna be one half times du times dv. So this is nice and easy. All right, our double integral over R of four times the quantity X squared plus Y squared turns out to be this new double integral. Now remember, our new bounds were these, X or U and V both ranged from negative one to one. So it really doesn't matter whether we integrate with respect to U first or V first, the bounds are negative one to one. Then we need this in terms of u and v, which happen to be this two u squared plus two v squared. We wanna multiply that by dA, which turned out to be one half of du dv. You distribute that one half, the one half times each of those twos is just gonna give us a one. And that is a very simple integral to evaluate. So to finish this, we'll just evaluate the integral. Trying to reuse my paper. I go through so much paper every semester. eventually goes in the recycling bin, but it's kind of nice to, to use it first, use it as much as possible so that we're not being wasteful. All right, now when we evaluate a double integral, we start on the inside and we work our way out. First, we're taking an antiderivative with respect to u. So we'll add one to the exponent here, divide by the new exponent, then bring your constant down. The antiderivative of this constant with respect to u is that constant times u. And we evaluate from the lower bound to the upper bound for u. When u equals one, we end up with one third plus v squared. When u equals negative one, we have negative one third minus v squared. I would distribute that negative Negative times a negative gives, gives us a positive. So we've got the integral from negative one to one of two thirds plus two V squared. And we're integrating with respect to V now. The antiderivative of a constant is that constant times our variable, bring the two down. Here, add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, and then evaluate from negative one to one. So at one, I get this. At negative one, 
I get this. So I have four thirds minus a negative four thirds or eight thirds. Now that is the value of this original integral. So you can say, well, what does that actually mean? Well, there are lots of things it means, or lots of things it could mean, depending on what that integrand represents. But let's say it represented this elliptic paraboloid. So I've got z equals four times the quantity x squared plus y squared. And I was looking at the volume under that surface over the region R, where the region R in the xy plane was a little um, square that looked like that. So that's the region R in the xy plane. I probably shouldn't have drawn it on top of the elliptic paraboloid, but you get the idea. So we've got this little diamond and you've got this elliptic paraboloid that's sort of coming up out of the page. And we want the volume between that elliptic paraboloid and that diamond. Well, it turns out that the volume between that elliptic paraboloid and that little diamond in the xy plane is the same as the volume under a different surface in the uv plane. And our surface in the uv plane is just um, given by z as a function of u and v equals u squared plus v squared. So that is going to look actually very similar. This one's just four times as tall. And then rather than integrating over this little diamond, we're integrating over a square where u goes, well, this is also a square. It's just sort of um, oriented differently. I want u to go between negative one and one, and I want v to go between negative one and one. And if I find the volume under this surface above this square, s in the uv plane, turns out I get exactly the same volume, which happens to be eight over three, that we would get if we took the um, double integral um, or the volume under this surface in the xy plane. I think that's pretty cool. Please let me know if you have any questions. Be happy to help.